Now, not everybody should probably be in leadership. Uh, there are people that are in leadership probably shouldn't be, and there's probably people out of leadership that ought to be, but not everybody should probably be in leadership. They, they just don't all have the gifts that are needed for leadership. Uh, a man came in late uh, for work one day, and it had been the second time that week he'd been late. And so his boss, a lady, called, her in, called him into her office and said, uh, well, what's your excuse this time? And he says, uh, well, my clock didn't go off, and I overslept. And she said, you could have at least told me something I haven't heard before. And so he said, you're looking lovely today. I don't think he's got that job anymore, but an executive of a large firm uh, finished a presentation to a major client, and it did not go well. You've had one of those? It just didn't go well. And so after the presentation was over, he's mad, and he starts snarling and griping at his secretary, and he says, where in the world is my pen? And she said nicely, it's behind your ear. And he howled back, you know I'm busy, which ear? <laughs> Not everybody should be in a position of authority because their attitude that they develop. A young executive leaving the office late one evening, uh, he was going through the office and he passed through the office. He came upon the CEO and the CEO was standing in front of a shredder, shredding machine. Y'all know what a shredding machine is? He's standing in front of a shredding machine, and he has one piece of paper in his hand, and he just looks bewildered. And he said, uh, listen, uh, this is a very sensitive and important document here, and, and my secretary's gone home for the day. Can you make this thing work? He said, sure. He flipped it on, and he stuck it in the thing and it disappeared inside making that noise you know how it is and and the paper was gone and he said excellent excellent uh, I just need one copy <laughs> not everybody should be in the leadership position I'm thinking uh, I, I thought this was neat a mediocre leader tells you what to be a good leader explains how to be, and a great leader demonstrates how to be. But a visionary leader inspires us to be. And, you know, the lack of vision uh, basically keeps us from seeing what our weaknesses are. We all have weaknesses, every last one of us. But if you don't have vision, you don't see it. And you don't see what your weaknesses are, and you can't work on that. Uh, for example... Uh, since most of us never read books anymore, I was listening to a podcast the other day and heard a man say, the failure to read enfeebles our vision. And I totally agree. Oh, that was a joke. It didn't go anywhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we don't read. But okay. Helen Keller. That's funny to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ellen Keller says, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but no vision. That's stated from a person that should know. John Maxwell said, people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. Mahatma Gandhi said, I must first be the change that I actually want to see. I must be the change. So too often I think uh, leaders don't have vision or don't have the vision they need to have. Sometimes all a leader has is stubborn will. And that's not a nice thing to say, but it's evident in scriptures that not everybody who claimed to have vision actually had a vision, if you will, representative of the will of God. In Jeremiah 23, 16, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. So sometimes our vision is just stubborn will. 
and that doesn't really reflect what's in the best interest of the people or around us. Lamentations 2, 9 puts it kind of like this. He says, her gates, talking about Jerusalem, her gates have sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. Sometimes you get so discouraged that you can't even see that things could ever be better. I hope you're not like that tonight. I hope you don't ever get like that. But likely, you have been like that. And likely, if you haven't, you will pass through that. Vision and vision loss is something that we're likely all to experience. Some of you have experienced vision loss. Some of you here have got diminished vision right now, and you've already been it, and you're not even older. But as we get older, we all experience diminished vision. Uh, clouds in our clouding of our lens, which is called cataracts, as you well know. There's a damage to the optic nerve that can happen, which is called glaucoma. There's damage to the retina, which can be either macular de degeneration or it can be diabetic retinopathy. But another one that's not very well known is if you just have low blood supply to your eye area, you can lose vision. But vision loss has more consequences than just not being able to see. If you can't be able to see and you're getting old, poor eyesight contributes to car crashes and or falls. I think of many of the falls that we talk about, well, she fell again, isn't necessarily about bad balance. Sometimes it's a bad vision. Can't see the little place in the floor. Can't see the chair that was there. Poor vision complicates poor balance, though, and hearing loss. So if you can't see, you know, then you can't see what I'm saying. But, you know, it's, you know, she's, it's true. It's hard to see. You can't look at someone's mouth when you're having a hard time hearing and look at their mouth and see what they're saying. Elijah, this is drawing it all back to Elijah. Elijah, after his great success in 18, it's probably the reason I put 18 up there and I was wrong. You see that? Elijah, after his great success in 18 uh, on Mount Carmel, where they actually had a great success in at least 400 or 800, depending on how you count it, of the bad prophets were done away with, goes into a, a time when he loses his vision for the future. It's, really, he doesn't see any future in his life. He doesn't see any future with the kingdom He's really depressed. It's bad. And he went through that because he had been through so much in 18 and the almost four years. If you, if you look at what he went through over those four years and how hard it would have been on him, it's easy to kind of see how he would get discouraged. So I, I suspect there are people out there very discouraged tonight and if you've been through, say, a rough year, or a rough two years, a rough three years, a rough four years, or a rough 40 years, however you look at it, I want to give you three examples of some things that happen to our vision that maybe you can recognize and you can avoid some of the blindness that comes with it. Number one, if you're filling in the blank, is what might be called leaving blindness. Leaving blindness. It's verses one through eight. I'm just going to spot read. You can stay with me if you will. Uh, I'll start with verse 1 and then I'll just kind of jump around. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, what happened on Mount Carmel. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. They'd taken them down to the brook and they'd executed them down there at the base of the mountain. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, particularly Baal, because that's what her family worshipped. So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she's basically putting a curse on herself if she's not able to kill him, which kind of got fulfilled in a way. If you drop down to verse 4, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Now he's running for his life from a woman who wants to kill him. And the first thing he does is pray that he'll die. 
And isn't that a weird thing to do? And he said, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Verse 5, uh, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And that happened twice. So what's interesting to me is many have quit, fill in the blank. Many have quit, and you just fill in the blank. Whatever it is, you've seen them quit. Many have quit, and they quit out of blindness. They thought they saw things perfectly clear, so they quit. But they actually quit at a moment of blindness. Beware if you're going to quit. Beware about quitting because you may be in a moment of spiritual blindness at that moment. In this case, he quit out of persecution, which is kind of strange because he should have known that everything wasn't going to just flip over and everybody would be right with this. But Mark 10, verse 30, you know, the Lord blesses us, but he blesses us with persecution. We don't just get all the blessings. You know, you'll, I'll get, whoever's left father or mother or land, or, we'll get a hundredfold with persecutions. So you have trouble, but you get the persecutions as well. You're going to have trouble. There's going to be somebody that doesn't like you. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, 2, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you say, well, that doesn't apply to work. It applies to everything. If you're at work and you're trying to be a Christian, and there's going to be people who are going to be on you just because you're trying to be a Christian. Don't quit just because somebody's on you because somebody is always going to be on you. That's just the way it is. If you're going to try to live for God, somebody's going to be picking at you, okay? I mean, somebody in your family, somebody at work, somebody in life, somebody's going to be picking at you. Don't quit at work because somebody's kind of nipped at you. That's not the way to be. And then he quit out of persecution, but he also quit out of desperation. Verse 4 makes it very clear. I mean, on the one hand, he's ready to die. On the other hand, he's fleeing for his life. But pressure and being crushed in your soul can give you a moment of despair. And that's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. He says we're pressed on every side but we're, we're, and we're crushed, but we're not perplexed. We haven't given up. And so don't quit because you feel desperate. I think too many people have quit good jobs because they felt desperate. It is a mistake to just quit, whatever it is. If you're on a sports team and now you feel very desperate, oh, it's just not going, don't quit now. You need to work through that. If after it's over and everybody has concludes and your boss concludes, you need to move on, well, then you don't have to quit. He lets you go. So you don't have to quit. Don't just quit. And then thirdly, something that happened to Elijah is he quit out of exhaustion. Too many people quit out of exhaustion. They get, get really tired. Things aren't going your way. You feel persecuted maybe. You're desperate. And now you're just exhausted. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, Paul says, I have been weary often. And often I've been sleepless. Don't quit because you're exhausted. The worst time in the world to make a decision is when you're absolutely dead on your feet. That's a terrible time. It's kind of like going shopping when you're hungry. You go grocery shopping when you're hungry. You know what you're going to do, right? You're going to buy too much junk, right? Well, if you, if you make a decision about your life when you're exhausted, you're going to make a poor decision. That's just a, So a lesson for those who have lost their vision, beware of this leaving blindness. When we get to thinking about leaving, suddenly we get kind of blind. We don't see things clearly. You really should go and talk to somebody else and follow somebody else's advice because right at that moment, you're actually pretty blind about your own situation and you now feel, oh, I'm persecuted. Oh, I'm, I'm in despair. Oh, I'm exhausted. It's really usually a bad time to quit. So maybe you need to get, if somebody else gives you that advice or a group of people give you that advice, okay, well, maybe then. Good Christians that are not engaged in that, it depend more on their uh, vision. So leaving blindness. Second type of problem is listening blindness. I, I'll just spot read again verses 9 through 14. And there he went into a cave. So he finally gets down to Horeb. And he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord 
came to him and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, when God asks you what you're doing here, he's not asking you what you're doing here. He's saying what you're doing here. Did that make any sense at all? Because I think I said the same thing. But it, it means not, I really want to know. I'm trying to tell you, you have no business being here. Okay? Uh, but, but let's go just a little further. Drop down to verse 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain. And broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Now isn't that interesting? And after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. You know what? Every event that happens on the earth is not a spiritual event that God is behind. Follow verse 12. And after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. We'll come back to that in a minute. Drop down to verse 14, just the latter part of it. And he says, uh, they've torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Um, you know, many have listened to the wrong things. Oh boy. And if you listen to the wrong voices, you're blind. You'll be blinded by the wrong Voices. Uh, i give you three here, but that leaders can get blind. Anybody can go blind here. But one is without the word. What's interesting is the word of the Lord comes to him and he doesn't really listen to it. He hears it, but he doesn't really listen to it. Uh, Matthew 15 verse 6 talks about how you can nullify the word with your own traditions, what you want to do. You can just nullify the word and do what you want to do. You say, well, we study our Bible here. But you can still do whatever you want to do. Right? You can still do whatever you want to do. People say, oh, I'm a Bible believer. I do what the Bible says. But I've seen a lot of people that say stuff like that and still do whatever they want to do. Right? They do whatever they want to do. And, and he, I like this one. Second Chronicles 16, verse 12 it says, talking about Asa, the king said that he did not seek to the Lord, but to the physicians. He had a disease in his feet. Don't know what that was. It may have been sugar diabetes. I don't know what it was. But he had a disease in his feet, and it was severe. And he went only to the physicians, and he never sought the Lord. Now, I want you to think about that. King of Israel, and would not, or king of Judah in this case, and he never one time prayed about it. Imagine that. How do, you, how do you get in that position? And, and so what I want to suggest to you is, is that a lot of us make decisions without the Word. And we claim we're making decisions in light of the Word. But if you've got a major decision, you really ought to look up some verses. Amen? It wouldn't hurt you at all to look at some verses from the Word of God and maybe get some advice from somebody who knows a little bit about the Word of God for that matter. And just hear the Word. Hear the Word of the Lord. What does the word of the Lord speak to this particular circumstance? It would be in your best interest because too often we're listening to everything. We'll listen to the news and we'll, we'll, we get all befuzzled over the news, you know. We act like it's the word of God. The news is not the word of God, amen? amen. It really isn't. And so, but, but without the word. And so, and then he did another thing. He did, he was making decisions without the whisper. He, he was into the fire and the wind and the earthquake. You see, the fire had fallen on Mount Carmel. There had been no rain for three and a half years. He was in, he was sold out to the big events. And that's not wrong because we all like that stuff. When God moves, we all like this big stuff. Oh, here he is, God's doing something. And we all go, yeah, that was the Lord doing that. We all love that stuff. But, you know, um, God moves more often than not in a whisper. I like Psalm 81, verse 5. This is in the message. You won't get this in your King James. It says, I, I hear, it's in, the, in your King James, but it don't read like this. That's what I meant to say. 
Uh, Psalm 81, verse 5. I hear this most gentle whisper from one I never guessed would speak to me. You know, too often we hear all of our buddies talking and we actually don't look for God in the still small voice to speak to us. Now, I don't know exactly what I'm talking about here because your circumstance is going to be different from mine and every one of us is going to have a slightly different pers perspective on that. But I do believe that God somehow leads us and whispers to us what we should do, either in events or through somebody speaking in our ear or literally something He might reveal to you in some strange way that I've never thought about. I believe God's involved in our life. If you look for it, amen? If you look for it, it's there. But you've got to look for it. But if you're the kind that you've already kind of turned your back to the Word, you might not be really willing to listen to the whisper out on that mountain face where he was at. And then finally, without the watchers. He was making decisions without the watchers. Verse 14 says, I alone am left and they seek my life. That was foolishness. It wasn't true. How many people tend to start thinking, I'm the only one who's doing this right? I do this right. Let me tell you something. I know that the world, the majority of the world isn't right about everything, but I have found the majority of Christians to be right about most things. Are you hearing me? The majority of Christians, their combined wisdom, is right about most things. There are honest witnesses watching God and watching men and what's being done, and they're aware. I like what was said about Jesus. Just the guys they sent to arrest him were honest witnesses. They came back saying, no man ever spoke like this. That's just an honest witness. I, I'm telling you, I believe that there are honest witnesses out there. And so if you've got a major decision to make, I highly recommend you getting feedback from those watching what's going on in your life. What do you see happening? And I, and I think that's true, by the way. I, I don't believe in the news, but I do believe in what my brethren are saying. And I like to hear what y'all have to say in reflection on what's going on. Uh, I, I don't want to be preached at about it too much, but I want to hear it. Amen? I want to hear it. I do. I want to hear it because I feel like there's wisdom in your heart, right? And I want to hear what your wisdom has to say. So if you're making a major decision, be sure you're listening to the right folks. Don't listen to just anybody and everybody. You need to be listening to the Word, listening to the whispers of God, and listen to those who are watching with you, the brethren who are watching with you, and the good people. you got good people at your job. Instead of listening to the ones you know aren't living right, listen to the ones you know are living right, even if they aren't Christians in the church, okay? You listen to them and get feedback from them before you make a major decision that was going to affect your wife, your children, your grandkids even. So a lesson for those who've lost their vision is beware of listening blindness. And then finally, number three, and that is leading blindness. Uh, there's a leading blindness that happens here. And if you're going to be a leader, you really need to listen to what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. Because all that before wasn't specifically so much to a leader. But this is specifically to a leader. Verse 15, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint. Verse 16, That was anoint Haziel. Verse 16, Anoint Jehu. Verse 16, Anoint as prophet in your place, Elisha. Anoint, anoint, anoint. You get that? Anoint, anoint, anoint. That's the job of leaders. Real leaders want to anoint. Listen to me, I'm coming back to that in a minute. Verse 18, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. That's interesting, kissing it, right? Verse 19, So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Sapheth, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. Then Elisha passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now, uh, then he arose and followed him, as you know, verse 21. You know, many have led, I hate to say it, in blindness and done a poor job throughout the history of the church. 
If you've been around a little while, you've seen some of them. From time, we've been really blessed with really good elders here. But I've seen from time to time some that, you know, you'd be lucky to get rid of them in a swap shop. I mean, it just, just not doing really that good of a job, not really trying. There are three uh, times that leaders will be blind if they do this. If they lead without anointing. Saul was anointed king. David was anointed king. Solomon was anointed king. Jesus was even anointed, it says. And elders and deacons are, in effect, anointed. Don't be afraid. Listen to me now on this. I've seen a lot of miles here, and I'm not kidding around. Don't ever be afraid of putting men in who are qualified to be elders or deacons. I don't believe you can have too many. I believe you can only have too few if you're afraid of the guy and what he might do. It's scary to me that we're scared of having more. When we get scared like that, I think we're afraid of the wrong thing. It is our job, if we're going to be leaders, it is our job to put men into leadership. Why? Because as you build more men into leadership, it takes some of the pressure off of you for one thing. Okay? It does do that. It gives you more wisdom. Amen? And it's true. Uh, if I haven't already, I will have been a part of, a, of getting somebody into the eldership who will want me to leave. If they haven't done that already. And I'm for that. I think we must be for that. I don't think you can have too many deacons. I think that's upside down and backward. Had this discussion with elders. Elders don't generally think this way. Elders generally think if you don't have a job for them, we shouldn't appoint deacons. I disagree with that. I'm just saying that straight up. I believe if you're qualified to be a deacon, we ought to have you as a deacon. And if you're not qualified or you ain't doing your work, you shouldn't be a deacon. That's where I'm at. So if you ain't doing your work and you call yourself a deacon, you ought to resign. If you're an elder and you're not doing your work, you ought to resign. Sorry. But if we have men who are qualified, we ought to make them that. Say, so, well, we don't have a job for them specifically. It's because I think we need to develop men that we must put them in, not because we're waiting for there to be a job available. We're supposed to be developing the future of the leadership of the church. And that's what's going on in this text. Secondly, without anointing, but there's another mistake, and that's without admitting, not admitting that you've been wrong. Uh, 7,000 haven't kissed those calves. Uh, it is a mistake when an elder or a preacher or a deacon can't go to the front row. We need, we, of all people on the planet, we need to be able to say we're sorry. This business about uh, if you're in a high position, you don't need to admit that you've made a mistake is hogwash. That's just not true. It, it, it builds strength of the character within you if you're able to do it, but more so it builds confidence in you. They know you're not a hypocrite because you're willing to literally lay it on the line and say, I'm not all I ought to be. But if you can't ever admit that, I'm not sure you should ever be in those positions. If you can't ever say, I'm sorry, I did it wrong, I don't know. Here's what I find. They did not repent, Revelation 9, 21. Revelation 16, 9. They did not repent, Revelation 16, 11. They did not repent. I think that's a sign of bad things when you can't say, well, I guess I was wrong about that 7,000 thing. I thought there was nobody around. I thought I was the only one. Turns out 7,000. How could there be 7,000? I'll tell you how there could have been 7,000. He had been hiding in the woods for three and a half years. He didn't know what was going on downtown. He'd had to hide out or they'd have killed him. So he didn't know. Don't think, well, preachers know everything. Don't listen to that, babe. But... That's just for the rest. <laughs> Third, without apprenticing, it's a major fault of leadership to not apprentice people, uh, to not try to develop people to take your place. Uh, I really, we need to be doing that uh, really hard in the next few years because I am 59. Somebody's got to take this place here, really. Seriously, that's not a joke. 
we really got to do that. And we need to do more of it. Uh, Jesus said, follow me. You got you to gotta replace yourself. Amen? You got to be a part of doing that. You can't be afraid of it. You got to step in the middle of it and say, we got to do this. That's the future. Amen? It's the future of the church. It's the future of the kingdom. Who cares about, you know, it going to hurt your feelings? You need to get over your feelings and replace yourself. Well, song leaders, y'all ought to be developing more song leaders. Uh, you, if you, y'all guys who do such an awesome job up here are kind of teaching it, but if you could grab a young guy occasionally and train a young person on how to do the Lord's Supper, you'd do so much good. How to lead a prayer. Well, some of you could grab somebody and show them how to lead a prayer. Some of us, we need all these young people speaking on the youth thing as, as often as we can. Amen. Because we need to develop them. We need to develop the next generation coming along. And that's leading blindness. And if you don't see the need of that, you don't need to be in leadership because that's what leaders do. They don't just take care of today, they take care of tomorrow. Dwight and I have often said, if we never saw a building, now it looks like we're going to see it now, but if we never saw a building out there on Lithia Pinecrest, that it would be okay if we delivered it to the next generation and they were able to do it. But until God gets involved, you know, it looks like God's involved now and wants to do something, but until that happens, I'm good with just providing it to the next generation. The next generation has to have something to do too, amen? It's, it's something to do. So a lesson for those of us who've lost their vision is beware of leading blindness. So those are basically the, the three lessons there that we've looked at tonight. You ever heard a guy named Bruce Lee? You know, Kung Fu, Wing Chun, Master. He said this. He actually wrote a poem. At least that's, it's been attributed to him. The doubter said, the doubter said, man cannot fly. The doer said, maybe, but we'll try. And finally soared in the morning glow while non-believers watch from below. I think we need to flip things over. I think... Especially if you're not blind. If you're going to have vision, you need to flip things over and see things from a positive perspective. I, I hear so many criers of doom. Oh, robots are going to take all, computers and robots are going to take all of our jobs. Oh my, so many jobs have been lost to computers. So many jobs have been lost to robots. And I just say to you, cry baby, cry baby. You know why they're taking your job? Because they can do what you can do now. But let me tell you something, there'll never be a day when there's nothing for a human to do. If nothing else, we're going to reprogram the computers, okay? We're going to make new robots. We're going to do something. And the truth is, I want to be relieved from doing silly things and do the more important things. And so let's build as many robots as we can. I want robots everywhere. I want robots cleaning my house. Feeding my dog, you know, mowing my lawn. Amen, mowing the lawn, amen. So, and, and then relieve me to do more important things like watching ESPN or something like that. There's, there's two shoes. I just think we need to look at things more positively instead of seeing negative in everything. There was two salesmen uh, who traveled to a third world country in search of new business opportunities. One man called his boss a few moments after he even landed. He walked around the streets a little while and he said this, this is a wasted trip, I'm coming back home. There is no hope here. Nobody here wears shoes, so there's no one to sell shoes to. You've heard the rest of the story. Another man landed just a few minutes later, calls home to his boss and says, It's amazing, sir. We w you just wouldn't believe what I found here. There's so much opportunity. No one here is wearing shoes I can sell to the whole country. It's all about your attitude. Amen? It really is. And so try to look at the brighter side. Don't get all foggy-eyed and, and get depressed. Maybe you feel you've lost your vision. Who hasn't? Wake up. We all go through that. We all feel like we've lost our vision at some point. But even though Elijah 
had lost his vision. He's beaten down, had a victory and beaten down. By the way, victories are a sure sign you're fixing to crash. When things go right, that's when things go wrong, okay? That's a good time for you to crash. But he did regain his vision. He did get back in. He didn't just quit immediately. It was years later before the Lord came down and took Elijah up into heaven. So don't just leave and don't just listen to anything and anybody. Don't assume that you're a good leader. Don't assume that if you aren't working on leaving a better world than you found and a better leadership than you are a part of, vision, my friend, sees the truth, it listens to the truth, and it follows the truth. That's what vision really does, real vision. So if you want to be a part of that, then that's leadership, but it's not all just about leadership. You see, it's just about living your life in a positive way. And I want to be a part of that, don't you? If you're here tonight and you need to rededicate your life or you need to obey the gospel, we want to give you that opportunity. But let me tell you something. Every one of us need to make an effort this week of trying to flip things over and see things a little more positively and have a brighter vision. Don't you think? Won't you come if you need to, though, while we stand and while we sing?